Hello, Happy New Year and welcome to Brain Food for General Counsel from Pinsent Masons, where we hope to give you the tools to help your organisation meet the challenges ahead. My name is Matthew McGee and I'm a journalist here at Pinsent Masons. Looking back at 2020, I'm sure many of us feel that it was a difficult, troubling and challenging year as individuals and organisations dealt with a global health crisis, the personal, business and economic effects of lockdowns and political instability and upheaval from events such as Brexit and an unorthodox US presidential election. 2021, we hope, will be better and that's what we're looking at today. Reasons to be cheerful for the year ahead. This isn't to be glib or smug. Many difficult choices and paths lie ahead and none of 2020's problems have gone away overnight. But as we start a new year and before normal day-to-day business takes over our brains, it's important to lift our heads a little and appreciate that not everything has gone wrong, that there are some signs of light and hope. So we got some help from some of the people you've heard from in the podcast during its first year. We asked Alistair Campbell, John Amici, Vicky Price and others what gives them cause for optimism. What aspects of economic, social or business life can give us an inkling that better times are ahead. It can be easy to get bogged down in the negative, particularly when we feel personally at risk and perhaps professionally stretched. But the world is largely improving and that's easy to forget. The UN says that there has been a 36% reduction since the 1990s in the percentage of the world's population living in extreme poverty. Polio has been almost eliminated, malaria prevalence severely reduced. In 1950, fewer than half of primary aged children went to school. Now it's nearly 90%. Life-saving DPT vaccinations have gone from being given to one-fifth of the world's population to four-fifths. And though global income inequality is still rising, this is not a perfect proxy for quality of life. As economist Charles Kenny notes in his book Getting Better, the spread of technology and ideas has lifted quality of life even where incomes have not risen. Health, education and civil rights improvements are not directly related to income and have greatly improved the quality of life in many places. I talked to seven experts in economics, politics and business about their reasons to be cheerful and there was remarkable harmony in their answers which mostly focused on two areas, the climate and youth. The year ahead will hopefully contain the UN Climate Change Conference COP26 which was postponed from 2020 in Glasgow where real progress is expected on meeting the Paris Agreement goals and those set in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. There will be a significant difference this year, though, and that will be the enthusiastic participation of a post-Trump US, as Pinsent Mason's Head of Client Strategy, Alistair Morrison, explains. I've got a good few reasons to be cheerful. I think that Trump coming to the end of his office in the US is uh, fantastic news because it will mean that the Biden administration will get on to the climate change agenda and sees that a core part of the US coming back in, both politically and economically. The US coming back in hard on the climate change agenda with COP26 uh, will be uh, really, really good to see. And I think it's climate change, if you look at it at a big level, uh, at a macro level, climate change is the one thing that I think if we tie COVID in, to climate change, I think we have some reasons to be cheerful. First thing I think that causes us to be cheerful when we link COVID and climate change is that COVID's shown that we can innovate using science, technology, data quickly. And some of those lessons might be applied in relation to climate change. So that's great news and I think will uh, help us find innovative ways of looking to solve the climate change issue from a technological and a scientific perspective. And I also think that the combination of European Union 
the United States, potentially China, um, and to a lesser extent, the United Kingdom, coming together to, uh, at a political level and at an economic level, will actually help the climate change agenda. At an economic level, the reserve banks are now kind of getting into climate change and thinking about climate change in a in a different uh, in a different way. Christine Lagarde at uh, the ECB is really making climate change uh, a top priority, and that's part of their core strategy. Um, so when you then look at green bonds, the financial sector starting to compete with each other on issuing climate change bonds. You look at both the U. EU and the US um, really tying green bonds into part of the COVID recovery plan. The work that Mark Carney is doing um, and uh, in relation to the TCFD, the Task Force for um, Climate Change Financial Disclosure. So you look at all of these kind of things, the pressure and the number of companies that will be adopting net zero um, climate change agendas, I think is all really quite good news. So when you look at the political, financial and the scientific uh, agendas and what we've seen as a result of COVID and we've seen the stimulus and the packages that will need to be put in place, I think that we've got some really good reasons to be cheerful when it comes to tackling the biggest issue that faces our planet, that of climate change. Former UK Minister and Harvard Fellow Douglas Alexander agrees that progress on climate will be one of the year's positive developments and says that advances in clean energy will be noticeable. My reason to be cheerful as 2020 comes to an end is that this spring, while naturally all of us were focused on the pandemic, the UK actually went more than two months, 67 days, without using any coal-fired power for the first time in 138 years. That's actually for the first time since the Industrial Revolution. And why is this little-known fact a reason to be cheerful for me? Because it's further proof that away from the terrible headlines of this year, there are still some really positive trend lines. Week by week, month by month, we are living through a renewables revolution that's decarbonising how we generate power. The power sector is now leading the way, but then will come the electrification of transport and then steel, cement and chemicals, some really tough sectors, all lanes moving in the same direction. And I think our response to COVID this year reminds us that as humanity, we can do hard things. Five years ago, the Paris Climate Summit came up with a mechanism, a long-term goal combined with short-term targets with political terms of office in mind. And it's actually working in creating a race to a net zero economy. That framework was agreed five years ago when the US, China, the EU and Japan all aligned around those ambitious goals. Five years on, with Biden's victory, suddenly the stars have aligned again. So COP26 in Glasgow this coming November can mark the next step forward on the road to net zero. But there's one more more personal reason that I'm optimistic in these pessimistic times. Last January in the pre-times, just before COVID, I taught a university class of 20 young leaders from right around the world. The course was about sustainability, but listening to those young people taught me something much more precious than the curriculum. Their interest, their idealism, and their passion has reminded me and reassured me this year that we are not powerless, even though the climate crisis is even greater than the COVID crisis. This is certainly a time of choosing for all of us to be part of the problem or to be part of the solution, but what an exciting time to be alive and choose to bend the arc of history towards that sustainable future. Former Alstom executive Philippe Joubert's Earth on Board helps companies align their actions with climate targets. He's spotted a trend amongst young professionals that he thinks is worth celebrating. They're beginning to come together to pressure their organisations to act more sustainably, a move he says is already having a major impact. This will be seen as the year where young students and, more importantly, young professionals have organised, structured a movement to start challenging the people in place. For example, uh, we have recently 
uh, a movement from student and young professional coming out of HEC, which is one of the biggest and most prestigious business school in France. Uh, they say, hey, we're going to change Dean. We want a Dean that understands sustainability and climate change. We think to be leading a business school now, you need some capacity of understanding the challenge of tomorrow. You have already some young professional organizing inside the big companies, the multinational companies, uh, in group of influence, and they go and see the chair or the CEO and, and say, hey, you need to be serious about, about the challenge of tomorrow. Uh, and these groups communicate between them. All these movements are organizing themselves, being structured, and challenging the situation, challenging the people in place, saying that we are not satisfied any longer with the way you are uh, managing all these problems. It will be like if all the students uh, graduated from Cambridge and Oxford suddenly goes to the streets and uh, and challenge the big banks or the big finance saying, we don't work for you any longer unless you start to be serious about climate change. This is not what we have seen with Greta Thunberg. This is different. Uh, Greta has been a uh, also very um, obviously efficient and, and, and certainly extremely important. These people, they are in their workplace and or in their university or schools and they influence the way they are educated and the way they, they are considered or they, they influence the, 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 the strategy and the, the priority of the companies in which they work which is completely different. This is much more down to earth. Beyond immediate concerns about economic collapse that faded reasonably quickly, the economic impact of the pandemic has generally been assessed in terms of the cost to future generations of paying the debts run up by countries when dealing with the crisis. But economist Vicky Price, former joint head of the UK Government Economic Service, says that it doesn't have to be this way. The pandemic has changed the way government debt is thought about. If we can keep up the tolerance of high public debt levels, this could transform the relationship between public spending and society for the better, she says. It's the acceptance that you can actually have a bigger debt to GDP ratio without worrying too much about it. And the fact that the monetary authorities are now much more interventionist in ensuring that the economy can recover, which really means that Quite a lot of the thoughts we had before about uh, the level of austerity that was needed uh, going out of the window, really, and not just here, but also in Europe. And for me, that's seriously important because we're moving towards a situation where um, there is acceptance that uh, uh, the the level of sustainable debt could be considerably higher, uh, but that it is considerably higher because you get support from the central banks, but also there is a lot more acceptance that the risks need to be shared between the richer countries and the poorer countries in Europe. So the Eurozone is reshaping quite significantly. And I think that makes a big, big difference in terms of how you manage policies in the future and also the involvement of the state. So a lot more leeway, a lot more flexibility and a lot more acceptance that the state can intervene at various stages to get to um, sorting out problems a lot faster than would have been the case otherwise if one had got stuck to the earlier perceptions of what is right and what is wrong in terms of support to uh, the economy when it gets into crisis. What may come to upset all this is politicians' obsessions yet again with getting back to normality. I think we should just forget about normality and not try and get back to the situation that we saw with austerity and so on returning. So I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably hopeful that lessons have been learned, but I can't guarantee that this will be the case. On the developing world side, I mean, the, the real concern is that uh, when we get out of this, there are going to be quite a lot of countries with even with the pretty bad um, borrowing problems. But what has happened and where I am slightly more positive is that uh, there has been a lot more willingness, again, by the international organisations to um, put 
extra money into those countries in special terms and also offer debt repayment holidays and encouraging lots of other creditors to do similar things. There's been quite a lot of buy into this, which is good news. Now, the question for all these countries would be what happens at the end? And in my view, the only thing that can happen is debt forgiveness. And I am suspecting, looking at what's been going on worldwide, that there would be a lot more chance of extra support to deal with the debt situation, including possible debt forgiveness, to support those countries to grow again, which will be pretty positive. The second thing about developing countries is, of course, that they are quite important in the fight on climate change, which I'm sure lots of people think it's a huge, huge potential to pursue it faster as a result of COVID. Um, But if they have no means to do anything, and they're really worried about getting their economies started again. Quite a lot of those developing countries are unlikely to think first about climate change. And I'm afraid that requires a big transfer of funds from the richer countries to the poorer ones, both for mitigation and adaptation to climate change. Vicky touched on the impact post-pandemic attitude changes might have in the developing world, and legal author and advisor Richard Suskin's thoughts have turned to that too. He hopes that the kind of digital processes forced on justice systems during COVID will leave a lasting and beneficial legacy for the billions of people living without access to the courts. One cause for optimism in my world, which is largely about trying to use technology to improve access to justice, is that the COVID crisis, tragic though it's been, has opened people's eyes to new ways of delivering legal and court service. Minds have been opened, minds have changed, and around the world we're seeing governments and court systems turning to technology as a way of increasing access to justice. Today only 46% of people in our world live under the protection of the law. My view is that the time is right. COVID provides a springboard for us to use technology to help people understand their entitlements and to help people enforce their entitlements. So in 2021, I believe, we have arrived at the time for online courts. My minor ambition, although it's not minor at all, is that we can increase that 46% to 50%. And if 4% more people have access to justice, enabled by technology, that means fundamentally changing the lives of hundreds of millions of people. The reality is that if it is easier for people to understand or enforce their entitlements, and as a global initiative, then this will likely change the behaviours of those governments who rely on the law being inaccessible, who rely on our courts being inaccessible to allow them, to permit them to behave as they do. In practice, this means that people who otherwise can't afford lawyers can determine their rights and entitlements, and they will be offered access also to speedy, low-cost dispute resolution that has the backing of the state. It's an entirely new way of helping people enforce their entitlements. My own vision of this, and it's one that I want to devote some considerable time to, is that we need to set up a global organization to coordinate the delivery of a standard platform, a technology platform that is uniform across all jurisdictions, but can be tailored to specific countries so that each individual country can very quickly introduce this enabling technology. Organisational psychologist and leadership expert John Amici thinks the pandemic will leave another legacy, that workers will be valued, respected and trusted like never before, which will help productivity as well as the well-being of those workers. I thought 2020 uh, was the year we began to see the humanisation of the workforce. People who had never been recognised before had the country clapping for them on a Thursday And in even, at least I hope, even some of the uh, more old fashioned workplaces, we started to recognize that human beings were human beings, not just units of productivity, that they had families at home, worries and concerns. And I think that 2021 will be the year that that continues to burgeon and that we see the mental health of human beings as holistic beings in the workplace be taken seriously. And, and and indeed, I think workers choose their workplace on the basis of being seen that way. There's no new normal. 
don't be cheerful about everything going back to normal. There's no new normal. The genie is out of the bottle. You can't recognize people who did the lowliest of jobs, the most vital and lowliest of jobs, and then think that they'll forget that they were seen. Workers in our organizations won't forget that it was perfectly possible to be productive and agile in your working practice. Nobody's going to forget. The companies that think they're going to go back to nine to five or eight to six in an office in some central part of some large city are the ones that won't exist in five years. The reason for workplaces to be optimistic, our productivity has risen. People have risen to the challenge, given a small modicum of flexibility and a little bit of concern about their humanity. That's a reason that workplaces should be excited about this change. Alistair Campbell, former advisor to ex-UK Prime Minister Tony Blair and now a campaigner, said that the way young people have dealt with the coronavirus crisis has changed his view of the younger generation and given him unexpected hope. I think I've actually been quite impressed by how young the younger generation has adapted pretty well in the main to a horrific 2020 on so many levels. So I think if there's a reason that I'm optimistic when there's so much to be pessimistic about and gloomy about, I sense that people of my children's generation and younger are going to make a better job of the future than we're making of the present. I'm seeing the way they've adapted to something that if you'd have said to me a year ago, this would have happened and how would the teens and millennials and 20s and 30s have reacted, I'd, I'd have been, I'd not have been confident, I'd have been very unconfident. Um, I'd have said maybe that they have not had, you know, really tough existential challenges to face uh, in a way that most generations have. And um, there may be, I guess I'd have bought into the kind of middle-aged old fart sense that they, you know, are a bit selfish and a bit superficial and what have you. And actually, I think, no, my sense has been talking to people, seeing how people are reacting, that I think they've they've got a sense of it. So I think that I think the world is in a mess, facing lots of inflection points in different places. And because of that reaction from a lot of people I know way, way younger than I am, I'm more hopeful than I was. I think they're reacting with the insight that they've got a lot longer to go than we have. Um, I'm 63 now, so, you know, I think about something like Brexit. Will we get back into the European Union or a form of it before I pop my clogs? Doubtful. Will the generation that I'm talking about come to a better place in our relationship with Europe? I've got no doubt about that at all. Some stirring thoughts there about how young people have handled the crisis, how they might be treated in future, and what impact they'll have on their employers and governments. And earlier, a consensus that unprecedented movement on climate action might give us cause to be proud when 2021 draws to a close. Hopefully, this has put a bit of a spring in your step after a tough year. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back with more Brain Food later in the year. In the meantime... Don't forget to subscribe to the Brain Food for General Counsel podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, you can keep up to date with hour-by-hour coverage of business law news by the Outlaw Reporting Team at pincentmasons.com. Brain Food for General Counsel was produced and presented by Matthew McGee for Pincent Masons, the purpose-led international professional services firm with law at its core.